Good morning, students. This lecture will be about the formation of the external shape of the embryo and the fetus. And in the second half of the lecture, I will talk about the skull and about the vertebral column. As you see this series of pictures, uh, in the first three weeks, we just have a group of cells and then a sandwich-like structure, first consisting of two layers, later than of three layers. But on the fourth week, during the flexion, this tube-shaped uh, formation of the body will appear. And in the coming weeks, on the fifth and sixth week, it's already clear that this will be kind of like a four-legged creature. But in this uh, stage, yet all four-legged creatures you look yet very much alike, let it be an alligator or a sheep or a human being. But on, at the end of the second month, more and more uh, human shape uh, will form. And here you see already the typical head form of a human and the limbs are also uh, human-like. Uh, in the exam, when we, you have to talk about the, uh, the signs of a newborn, then typically we hear, hear that the, the, uh, the, the, it has legs and feet, but legs and feet appear already at the end of the second month, as you see it here. Look how small they are if you compare it to the adult size fingers. You have to know that how big is a, an embryo and then a fetus during the pregnancy in each month. Uh, there is a table also in your uh, book, in your textbook, but I find this uh, table a little bit more simple, so you can follow this one and calculate it very simply. That if we divide the 40 weeks of gestation, and I have to stress this word gestation, 40 gestational weeks, into 10 lunar months, then we, uh, each of it would be four weeks. And in the first five lunar months, if you square the number of the months, then you get the length of the, of the baby. So for example, in the third month, the baby is around nine centimeters long. Or in the fifth month, five by five, it's 25, 25 centimeters long. And in the next five lunar months, you have to add always five centimeters in each month. So you get to the end with about a 50 centimeter long embryo. That's the average, uh, uh, fetus, pardon. Uh, that's about the average size of a newborn baby, 50 centimeters long. And uh, the weight in the first half of the pregnancy is not that much important. Uh, of course, it grows slowly and it will weigh always a little bit more, but it becomes more interesting from the 24th week of the gestation, because the 24th week is a limit nowadays in the developed countries that if a baby is born on the 24th week of gestation, then the doctors have to treat that baby even if it doesn't show signs of life. So it may be that the baby will breed and show, show uh, signs of life, but it may be that it looks like being uh, born dead. But even then, they have to try to intubate and treat the baby. So this is a limit the 24th week. And on the 24th week, what, what weight you can expect? It could be between 500 and 800 grams. So on the 32nd week, it's, it's between 1,200 and 1,800 grams. And a healthy baby at the end of the gestation, it's around 3 kilograms, 3,000 grams. Sometimes it's a little bit smaller, sometimes it's a little bit bigger. Uh, it's not good if it's too much bigger that may have also disadvantages. So as I told you, until the third week, there is no uh, major happening. And on the fourth week, the flexion will happen. So there you see the closing neural tube with anterior and posterior neuropore. You also see here these little units. Uh, these are the somites. And by the end of the fourth week, it has a head process, a tail process. It has the limb buds, and it has a heart and liver primordium, it uh, bulges forward the anterior body wall of the uh, embryo. How does it look on the fourth week? So there you see the brain vesicles, the three major brain vesicles. Here is the heart and the liver. That's the dorsal aorta. And you little bit see also the somites here due to the tiny arteries which divide them, which run between them, segmental arteries. There is also one of the uh, pharyngeal arch arteries uh, visible here. And there you have the umbilical cord vessels, two arteries, and one vein. 
On the fifth week, the paddle-shaped limb buds will appear. Here is the arm bud, and here is the leg bud. <coughs> there you have the eye primordium, but actually what you see here, that's the lens placut, from which we get only the lens of the eye. Here is the heart, and there is the liver. There you see also the brain vesicles and the umbilical cord. Uh, at this stage, we can already measure the so-called crown rump length. This is, in this case, it's the longest, longest diameter of the uh, body. Uh, later, it will be uh, from the top of the head until the, uh, the tip of the sacral uh, bone, the coccygeal bone, actually. And uh, if the baby has already limbs, and also in the adult life, we may also measure the crown heel length. The proportion between these two lengths, it's also important sometimes in pediatrics because there are some malformations when the normal proportion between the, uh, the trunk of the body and the limbs uh, will change, and so it might be interesting to compare the two. <coughs> On the sixth week, the end uh, of the limb buds will flatten, and soon rays will appear, like with the ragdoll, you know these sewn little lines. Uh, here you see the, the crown rump length of the baby, that's here the yolk sac. And in this one, where uh, the uh, embryo is sitting, swimming in the amniotic sac, in the fluid, uh, uh, besides the limb, developing limbs, you also see here the heart primordium, the liver primordium, the umbilical cord, brain vesicles, here the uh, Rombencephalon is well visible, and you see this brown spot. What could be this brown spot on that territory where you expect the eye to be? It could be the pigment epithelium of the eye. That's the most posterior layer of the retina, and uh, it's developing also from the neural tube. So that's the brown spot here, containing melanin, uh, and it's the pigmented epithelium of the eye. From the third to the eighth week, we call this developing creature the embryo, and this is the period of organogenesis. So in this period, all major organs develop, or the anlage for the organs is established. Some of the organs are already ready, like the heart. Why the heart? Because always that uh, develops first what is most needed. That, that, that is shown by that, that on the third week, the development of the nervous system will begin, begin and on the uh, fourth week, the neural tube will close. And at the beginning of the fourth week, the heart is already pumping the blood around because it's needed for the optimal nutrition uh, of the embryo. So what do we see on the seventh and on the eighth week? On the seventh week, uh, the limb uh, primordia will be segmented. There, is a pro there will be a proximal and a distal uh, portion between them, then the elbow, and on the lower limb, the knee will form. Uh, you, you shouldn't imagine it like the continuity is broken. Of course, in anatomical sense, it's not continuous, but if you take it from the histological sense, then what, you, what do you have? Then you have already a part of ossified uh, cartilage due to the chondral ossification. Then comes the cartilage, which gives also the articular surface. Then comes the so-called articular gap, which is a virtual space, but that is filled with synovial fluid, which is actually very much similar uh, to the amorphous ground substance of connective tissue. And on the next side, you, you again have a, a cartilage and the bone. So that's how the joints form, uh, that there is a segmentation, and in the gap, there are no fibers and no cellular elements, just a special kind of, of amorphous ground substance, which is the synovial uh, fluid. In this, uh, these weeks, in the seventh and the eighth week, about half of the body length of the crown rump length is given by the head. Uh, the head is, uh, is developing much faster than the other body parts. Nervous system is very important for, uh, for the development. And already on the sixth week, uh, the ossification centers will appear, and the long bones will start to ossify, and by the eighth week, a pretty big portion of the bones is already uh, ossified. Here you see the primary ossification centers at the twelfth uh, week of the pregnancy, where you see that the long bones are pretty much ossified yet. 
if an ultrasound examination uh, is made, then they measure also the femur length. But you have to count with that that not the true femur length will be measured by ultrasound because the cartilage is not visible uh, that well with the ultrasound examination. The, the ossified part of the femur is measured. Here you will have yet the distal end and here the proximal end. In the proximal end, probably in the major trochanter, you have already a secondary ossification center appearing. How do the limbs develop? So there are the limb buds, and within the limb buds, there is a so-called apical ectodermal ridge. Here it is enlarged. This is this apical ectodermal uh, ridge. Uh, this produces a factor, FGFs, fibrocyte growth factors, and this will regulate the proximal distal growth of the, of the actual limb. Next to this uh, apical ectodermal ridge, there is a vascular channel, this marginal sinus, and this marginal sinus will give the main artery of the limb. Like on the upper limb, you have the subclavian artery, the brachial artery, the radial artery. Uh, it runs round, uh, uh, down like a, a relatively straight ray, and the, all the other branches will be side branches of this uh, marginal sinus. On the border between these two territories, there is the so-called zone of polarized activity. This zone of polarized activity produces a factor which is called the sonic hedgehog. Sonic hedgehog, SHH, -H, it is abbreviated. That's also a signal molecule and it will determine the anteroposterior axis. And you have to calculate with that, that uh, during the development first, the anterior posterior axis is like the thumb is looking forward and the little finger is looking backward, right? And the joints, the big joints, the elbow and the, lower, uh, the, the uh, knee joint on the lower limb, they are looking laterally. But in the mammalian development, the limbs will have a rotation and the elbow will look due to this rotation backward and the uh, knee will look anterior with a medial rotation. So there is a rotation and because of this, actually this sonic hedgehog signal molecule uh, will determine the medial lateral axis due to this 90 degree rotation. Also the doors of ventral axis is, de is defined uh, by uh, Homo box uh, derived transcription factors. Now where, do, where does this funny name sonic hedgehog come from? Uh, there were researchers in the United States who were working on these topics and they found a certain factor and it's up to the researchers that what funny name they give to this factor. So you do not have to look for too much logic in these names. And since they love this hedgehog animal, they called it Indian hedgehog. Then they found another one which was similar in structure to this first one. They named it desert hedgehog. And when they found the third one, they only had the cartoon figure sonic hedgehog. So they named it after the sonic hedgehog. And this became most, most famous of all these uh, factors. And you will hear yet also with the development of the nervous system or facial development about uh, this factor. So uh, here we see an upper limb bud. Look at this nice round shape, which was removed from the embryo together with the spinal ganglia and the spinal nerve. So this must be here then C5, C6, C7, C8, thoracic one. This will give here the brachial plexus. Uh, from the very beginning on, the spinal segments are connected with the developing limbs and any developing territory, and they regulate each other's development. So if there is uh, something happening to the limb, like the vascular channel is closed and there is no limb development, then also the appropriate parts of the central nervous system will be underdeveloped. And on the contrary, if there is a problem in the central nervous system with the spinal cord or with the spinal ganglia, uh, then, uh, then, also, then the periphery will not develop. So these, these have a, a vice versa effect on each other. Uh, if this vascular channel is closed, then uh, that happened in the 1950s and 60s, uh, mostly in the European uh, countries like in France and Germany, the situation was quite bad. 
uh, that the vascular channel was closed due to a uh, medication which was advised to be taken uh, for, uh, to women uh, for morning sickness. And they, when do they have the morning sickness? In the second month, exactly in that period uh, when, the, uh, when the limbs were developing. And they, these were followed then by major malformations in the limbs. This is another picture about this apical ectodermal ridge. And there you see it enlarged on a scanning electromicroscopic picture. So it's really a nice ridge in the continuity of the ectoderm. Uh, this series of pictures shows you the development of the limb bud. I, on the first picture uh, earlier, I showed you that first it was round, then it becomes angulated, then these rays will appear, then along these rays, the cells will die with apoptosis, but for a, f a short period, there will be yet a membrane between the fingers, but then that's also uh, resorbing, and then you have the separate fingers. And here we are about uh, on, the, on the eighth week. So by the end, eighth week, by the end of the eighth week, uh, then the fingers are separated from each other, and you have these little pads, and uh, you could think that these are fat pads, but of course at the end of the second month, there is no fat tissue let, yet deposited. Uh, in the embryo. So these, these little pads, what you have here, these are condensation of the, meso uh, of the mesenchymal tissue uh, ready to form the receptoral, ar receptorial areas. Uh, the lower limb follows the development of the upper limb a few days later, but similarly. And as I told you, the upper limb has a lateral rotation, the lower limb has a medial rotation, and this medial rotation of the lower limb you can follow very well uh, with the course of the femoral artery, which is in the anterior territory in the inguinal lesion, and then it twists around the femur and it will appear in the popliteal region uh, on the backside of the lower limb. This is due to this uh, medial rotation of the lower limb. If you further look at the, the fingers, then on the opposite side, on the dorsal surface of the uh, fingers, you have the uh, rudimentary nail territories. Nails are very important uh, for the sensory function. It gives a stable background. Uh, if you touch something, then you feel it better if on the other side you have a healthy nail. Of course, uh, malformations may happen, like, for example, the polydactyly. Uh, on the example of the thumb, you can see that the distal phalanx is bifid uh, or separated, and if it's separated, then the proximal phalanx may be bifid, and so on. Or it, it's possible that even the, uh, the thumb has an extra phalanx. And uh, this, as, as these malformations happen, it may be an extra thumb here, or it, they may be fused or even more fused because here you have two nails, here you have uh, one nail. So uh, f f in order to see what was the exact background, of course, we would have to make a, an x-ray. Uh, syndactyly and polydactyly, they may appear uh, as a, in one person as a common problem uh, or separately. Here you see uh, the polydactyly problem that here you have extra little fingers, a six finger, like here on the x-ray you see. It's a rudimentary finger. These rudimentary fingers do not always have a good innervation and a good mobility. Uh, if they don't function well on the hand, then you have to remove it. Uh, sometimes uh, they are perfectly formed. That's uh, the, the rare situation, but sometimes they look exactly like the other fingers and they function well with the other fingers, of course, then you don't have to do anything with it. Here uh, you see syndactyly, uh, on one hand it's a uh, 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 more deformed uh, situation, that, and on the, on the other hand you see more or less these three fingers uh, formed. If, if uh, the examination showed that they have their individual bones, nerves, arteries, and tendons. Uh, then they may be separated, like also this one probably could be separated. And uh, the separation in the last 20 years, they found out that silicon is used for, uh, may be used also for better purposes than to enlarge breasts. 
uh, of course, when breast is enlarged, then also the skin will, will have to be bigger on the surface, it has, has to cover a larger surface. But here in these uh, cosmetic surgeries, which are very important for these people who have these mal malformations, it may be pumped under the, uh, the skin. The skin is uh, stretched, you have a greater surface of skin, and if it's, uh, it's uh, operated and separated, then there is enough skin to cover the wound. So that's a clever solution, which they didn't think about 30, 40 years ago yet. Animals, they also have sometimes polydactyly. This is a cat in Key West from Hemingway's garden, because Hemingway had a cat which had six toes, and ever since those six-toed cats are living in that garden. Okay, so uh, on this picture you see the so-called phocomelia. So this is the problem when the, uh, when the limb doesn't develop. Uh, this may have many different causes in the background, and one of these might be uh, the, the thalidomid or contergan medication which was taken during the limb development. Uh, here, this problem is called the macrodactylia, macrodactyly. Uh, that's actually a fibrolipoma, Everything is bigger, the bones are bigger, the connective tissue is more, everything is bigger. Uh, and uh, from this you cannot carve a smaller uh, hand. Uh, in this, if it's not functioning well and the person cannot use the hand well, then is no, there is no other solution but to uh, amputate it, remove it, and uh, it might be that a prosthesis will give a better life chance and Quality, life quality for the person who has this type of malformation. Uh, this, what you see here, is cleft hand or split hand, or it's called, called also lobster hand. In this case, the third ray of the hand or foot is missing. It's uh, varying whether these other two rays are united with each other or remain uh, separated. Uh, this is also in the background here, there is also a homobox gene problem, the DLX5 and 6. Okay, but let's follow further that what happens with the external shape. So at the end of the second month, we have already a fully developed heart and uh, we have the limbs. Now what happens next? The eyes will move in the third month ventrally and the ears to the side. Originally, the eyes were positioned more laterally, but in all hunting animals, like humans are also hunting animals, the eye will move anteriorly to have a better uh, vision, uh, better three-dimensional vision. Those animals which, ha which are prey animals, those have always their eyes on the side, like the rabbits or those birds which, which are prey animals. Uh, the owl that has the eyes on the front because the owls are hunting, for example. Okay, so and you also see the, the already the, uh, the ribs as they, they show through this very thin uh, superficial layer, which is not really yet skin. It's this uh, ectodermal tissue on the surface. You also see here the yolk sac. And because this is in the third month, and we expect this to be between somewhere between seven and nine centimeters, the length of the baby, uh, we, you may see also that the York sac is not that small, so it must be at least one centimeter in diameter. At this uh, time, the baby has already no umbilical hernia. So we discussed that the, as the, as the uh, mid-gut forms for a while, it is sitting, this mid-gut loop is sitting in the so-called physiological umbilical hernia, and at the beginning of the third month, it pulls back and the anterior body wall closes. And these babies, they may already move. Uh, they have muscle contractions, they are very weak yet, so the mother doesn't feel yet, but they are moving and feeling well in the uterus. In the fourth month, the eyelids uh, will uh, develop, they grow together, similarly like in kitten, they, it grows together, and in, in the case of kitten, it opens up only after being born. In humans, it opens up between the 22nd and the 24th week of gestation. And this period, from the third month on, we call it already fetal period. So for the first two months, that's the embryonic period, and from the third month on, you may call it already a fetus. In the third month, typically an ultrasound examination is made, 
And in the, during this examination, the so-called nuchal translucency is examined. The nuchal translucency, it's, if it appears, it's kind of like a, an edema, lymphedema. It's, uh, it's an empirical finding that this uh, uh, occipital region lymphedema may be connected with developmental malformation. So the gynecologists, they look for this. So this is here normal between these two layers, this distance, and this is here abnormal, it's dilated. And uh, this show, uh, uh, babies who have this nuchal translucency, it incre has increased nuchal translucency, uh, they have a greater risk for having uh, some kind of a malformation. So you have to go after it. Here you see this table which shows that if there is no problem uh, with, the, uh, with the nuchal translucency, then there is a little chance for chromosomal defects and for fetal deaths, etc. And if it's wider, the more wide it is, the more chance it is to have uh, some kind of a fetal problem. Uh, but this doesn't mean that it's sure that the baby has a, fe uh, a problem. It only means that you have to be careful and you have to look after uh, the possible malformations. In the fifth month, on the surface, uh, lanugo hair will appear and the eyebrows will grow. The mothers start to feel the movements between the 16th and 20th week of gestation. And as the nervous system of the uh, uh, fetus matures, with that, uh, they will be able to swallow amniotic fluid, and they already have also a key functioning kidney. And with this functioning kidney, this cycled fluid is driven back uh, to the amniotic cavity as urine. Uh, the keratinization will uh, start on the surface, and because of this, they will have already the fingerprints. Here you see the genital organs already developing. And at this stage, uh, they are already distinguishable, so they look different in male and female. Initially, in the third month yet, it looks very much alike. In the sixth month, the skin, which we may call already now skin on the surface, it has already the glands, and these glands are special in this case. They, they, produce a so-called vernix caseosa. Why is this needed? Because if you have on the surface keratinization, then you have to protect, protect the keratin layer from the surrounding fluid, similarly to divers who use special creams on their body surface. Uh, after the 28th weeks, uh, week, uh, the, the, in the lungs, the surfactant will be formed. Actually, it starts already a little bit earlier, but it's not enough what is produced earlier. Between the 28th and the 32nd week of gestation, it might be enough, uh, this special substance in the lung. And after the 32nd week, it's usually enough. The surfactant is important for the optimal functioning of the lung. It allows the alveoli to open uh, with the breathing. Uh, the babies at this time point, they have an excellent hearing. The auditory ossicles, the tympanic cavity, the labyrinth, the eardrum in a newborn is as born as in an adult. So it doesn't grow already later a lot. And it's very important that you protect your ears. Don't listen to very loud music because you don't have too many hair cells in your ears, which will allow you to hear also uh, well if you are over 50. Uh, well, from here on, there are no major changes uh, in, the, um, uh, in the fetus. Uh, the nervous system does the maturation, of course, so that is, is a long developing uh, organ. But from the seventh month on, uh, what mostly happens that subcutaneous fat pads uh, will be deposited, plus the maturing of the lungs and the eyes, uh, that is uh, running yet parallelly. And in this time, the babies sleep in 90% of the time. Uh, they sleep a lot. So babies do the same things in utero as what they do when they are born. Right? They can suck their fingers, they can move around, uh, they are awake, they are moving or sleeping, and then they are not moving, uh, and they have certain reflexes. 
from, this, uh, from the seventh month on, they have the so-called embracing reflex on noises. So if a pregnant woman in this time period hears a loud noise, then feels or usually feels also a movement of the baby. And uh, if a newborn baby, you clap your hand next to a newborn baby, then they will start to make a kind of like an embracing uh, movement. Uh, this is the remnant of that, that as, as you know, that little monkeys are clinging on their mothers uh, with this embracing reflex. In human babies, this is not enough strong to be uh, kept on the mother, of course, but uh, the signs are for this reflex are there. Now, at the delivery, when does the delivery happen? 40 weeks from the last period, and these are the 40 weeks of gestation. But this is only 38 weeks from the conception, right? So that's uh, 266 days if it's perfectly optimal, everything. The 40 weeks we may divide into nine calendar months or 10 moon months, lunar months. Uh, this discrepancy between the true length of pregnancy and the gestational weeks is uh, more and more Im important and interesting today because it's quite awkward nowadays that, uh, for example, during in vitro fertilization, when they uh, collect the eggs from a woman in the middle of the cycle, they fertilize it, uh, they let it grow on, on the plate for about five days, and they re-implant it into the uterus. They call it already the third gestational week although they know that it was just fertilized five, week, five days earlier. Uh, so uh, probably in your lifetime yet this nomenclature will change. Uh, nowadays it's quite mixed uh, sometimes. So what's the weight? It's between 3,000 and 3,500 grams and the, uh, the length is 50 to 52 centimeters. If you do not know how much this is, try to look at some things in the shop when you go next time that how long is 52 centimeters and what's the weight, what we call 3,000 grams. The head in this, uh, at, at the time of birth is about one-fourth of the body length. And if the baby is born before the 37th week, we call it premature. If, it, if the baby is born later than the 40th week, uh, then we call it postmature. That's also not good. Then, for example, the vernix caseosa disappears, and you see that the skin is, skin is kind of like soaked, like if you are sitting in the bathtub for a long time. If the weight of the baby is under 2,500 grams, <clears throat> then we call it low birth weight. Or if it's under uh, 1,500 grams, we call it very low birth weight. And if it's under 1,000 grams, we call it extremely low birth weight. What may be in the background? First of all, it may be a premature baby. Or it may be a small for gestational age. Or it may be that it has this maturity or retardation. Retardation means that once, uh, uh, so either the growth was not, uh, the speed of growth was not, uh, right, or once uh, in a period was already somewhat larger, but it stopped further development or even lost weight due to placental dysfunction. So there may be many things in the background. Nowadays, having a baby is not that much pig in a poke like it was 40 years ago. 40 years ago, there was no ultrasound and women didn't know whether it will be a boy or a girl. Just at birth, you, you got uh, the sex of the baby. Uh, but uh, this is not the only advantage of, of uh, the ultrasound examinations, but with the ultrasound examination, many, many uh, malformations can be detected in advance, and the doctors at birth may be prepared uh, for those malformations, and they can be treated immediately after birth. If there is a suspicion that's, that uh, there is some kind of a chromosomal or genetical problem, then with amniocentesis or chorion biopsy, uh, fetal cells may be collected and examined genetically. Or uh, sometimes, like uh, with hydro certain cases of hydrocephalus, also intrauterine operations, manipulations, uh, may be performed. Uh, when, you are, when we are in the real lecture room and I, I show you this diapositive, then usually I hear a kind, kind of like a soft murmur in the lecture room. Why? Because if you look at a baby, uh, then you have some, always some kind of a warm feeling. And why does this appear? This is something which is deeply embedded in our nature. Because the facial cranium is smaller, relatively smaller, than the, than the neurocranium. Uh, this changes, right? In the neonate, the facial cranium 
uh, is relatively smaller if you compare it with the, uh, with the uh, neurocranium. In adults, it will be relatively bigger. That's why you have the fe uh, feeling that panda bears are cute, because you think that that lot of fur in the back, uh, that is neurocranium, and the proportions are so that you, you have a warm feeling for panda bears, and you don't have this warm feeling uh, for the alligators, because they have a big uh, facial cranium. So this is an ethological imprint in our life. OK. So uh, the mother's weight gain should not be more, actually, uh, than 10 kilograms, and definitely not more than 14 kilograms. From that, the baby is about 3 kg in amniotic fluid and placenta, uterus and breast, uh, blood and bloody fluid. They all add up. And altogether, it shouldn't be more than 10 kilograms. If the mother uh, gains too much weight during the pregnancy, that may lead to severe uh, complications, like toxemia or diabetes. Uh, high blood pressure, and so, et cetera, so it's, it's not a good thing. And it's difficult to lose uh, this extra weight after pregnancy. And the extra weight, that is, is a very unhealthy uh, situation. As you see, in Hungary, it's not a very good situation. And that's one cause, for example, why the COVID uh, mortality is so high in Hungary, because there are too many people who have uh, overweight. OK, so what about the mature baby? It has the weight and length that we've discussed. It's not, there is no lanugo on the body surface, except for the head. Yeah, that, that hair with what the baby is born, that's called the lanugo. Uh, the testes are in the scrotum, and the major labia, they cover the minor labia in female. The nails cover uh, the tips of the fingers. And it, uh, the ba these babies have certain reflexes. I willingly wrote the word here, certain reflexes. You don't have to know these reflexes. Only that much about the reflexes, that they change by week, uh, week by week. So if a neonatologist doesn't even know anything from the baby but examines the reflexes, we'll be able to tell on which week the baby was born, which week of gestation the baby was born. Uh, after birth, uh, the uh, amniotic uh, cord is clipped down, and here you see the amnioectodermal junction. This is already a little bit after, so about one day after uh, uh, birth, and you see here the skin of the umbilicus, and it abruptly grows over to the amnion. It's blue because of disinfectant solution. So normally, of course, it's not blue. So this is the amnioectodermal junction, but was originally at the edge of the trilaminar germ disk, where the ectoderm was continuous with the amnion. You have to go back to that lecture. Maybe you understand it now better. This is a baby right after being born. Uh, here, again, you see this amnioectodermal junction. Here, the amnion and the skin, right? They have a very sharp uh, border. And you see this whitish substance on the surface. This is the vernix caseosa. Uh, in the first week, uh, this uh, piece of amniotic cord will mummify, so it dries out. And then on the second week, it will fall off spontaneously. Uh, the university has an honorary doctor. And once he gave here a lecture, and I, I asked him to give me uh, these figures, uh, actually, the data in Europe and also in Hungary are also very similar. Uh, his name is Edward Bell. Bell. He works in Iowa. And on this table, you see that if babies are born on the 23rd, 24th, 27th week of gestation, what are the chances that they are uh, growing up to be uh, healthy uh, adults? There are even chances, as you see, for very low uh, very, very young, very small babies, although decreasing. The yellow ones are the, the babies who survive, but they are impaired. And the red columns show the ones who die. So if a baby nowadays is born uh, after the 25th week of gestation, then has pretty good chances to survive. And they can be treated so uh, that they will be also uh, healthy uh, children. So they are not hopeless. And uh, here you see an example. 
also from Edward Bell's collection. Alicia, she was born with 349 grams, very, very small. You see this foil over her, this is actually kitchen foil because at this stage, uh, the keratinization on the surface of the skin is so thin that she had to be protected against evaporation and drying out with kitchen foil, foil like a sandwich. Uh, and she was here one day old and you see that the leg is smaller than the index finger of an adult. And uh, at four years, she was already a pretty nice looking little girl. Now she must be around 10 or 14 years. I don't know exactly how, how many years ago this was. Uh, if you would like to see cases like this, you can go to this web page, which was also established by Professor Bell. Uh, and from, where, from everywhere all around the world, uh, these miraculous small babies are reported. And now a little bit about the skeletal system. The skeletal system is formed partially from the paraxial mesoderm, from the somitomeres and somites, partially from the parietal mesoderm, and in the head and neck region from the neural crest. Neural crest also contributes to that ectomesenchyme. Uh, there are bones which ossify with desmal ossification, like the calvaria, facial bones, and a part of the calvicula. Highland cartilage models have, uh, the, other, the other bones have highland cartilage models, and those ossify with chondral ossification. In the skull, we have the neurocranium and the viscerocranium. And the neurocranium consists of the calvaria. This contains flat bones, which mostly ossify with, uh, des which ossify with desmal ossification. And the chondrocranium, uh, which gives the base of the skull, that has two parts, precordal and chordal. Uh, neurocranial precordal. I will show you what these words mean. But the precordal has also uh, neural crest uh, uh, material, and the cordal has mostly paraxial mesodermal uh, territories. The viscerocranium mostly ossifies with desmal ossification. Uh, what is this precordal uh, and cordal chondrocranium? The corda dorsalis. Uh, that runs through the uh, body of the vertebrae and through the middle of the intervertebral discs as nucleus pulposus, and it ends at the dorsum cellae. So up to this point, this is the chordal neurocranium at the base of the skull, and here you have the pre-chordal uh, chondrocranium. To this also neural crest cells uh, contribute. Uh, we will learn more about the viscerocranium in the second semester with the formation of the face. Uh, we have the pharyngeal arches. The first pharyngeal arch, the two subparts, will give the maxillary and the uh, mandibular arch, from which also several bones will ossify. And what's the origin of the uh, material of the of the skull, uh, we have different figures in different books. One variation is shown here that the blue territories, they have a mixed uh, uh, ectomesenchyme, partially from neural crest. The red ones, paraxial mesoderm, and the laryngeal territory has the lateral plate mesoderm. But according to other figures, uh, the uh, paraxial mesoderm gives more material and the uh, ectomesenchyme with neural crest that gives somewhat less. It's not that important to know the exact border. Uh, bones are remodeled. That's a very important process that is also in one of the embryo topics. And you heard about the remodeling with the ossification uh, in histology. But where do we see this remodeling? Uh, when, uh, when you look at the mandible of an adult, then the mandibular angle here, that's uh, close to 90 degrees. Uh, if someone loses the teeth, then this will be an obtuse angle, as it was already in neonates. So the mandibular ones will remodel from neonate to adult type and from adult type to uh, mandibular senilis in case the person doesn't have prosthetic teeth. If the person wears prosthetic teeth, then it's uh, not that strong, this remodeling. Here you also see this obtuse angle of the baby mandibular. What happens in, the, in the old pe people who don't have teeth? Uh, that the teeth will disappear, but also the alveolar processes, because there is no need for the alveolar processes, so the bone will be remodeled. And with this, if they, if they yet uh, want to close the mouth, the, uh, the, tip, uh, the uh, 
mandible will get higher and the nose will get lower, so that, that's how you get the wicked witch uh, shape of the, of the face. Doesn't happen only to women, happens also to men. This is just a picture about a, a skull, base of the skull uh, in the third month, so you see more or less all the major features already in it. And about the ossification centers and the, and the fonticuli, uh, you heard in the uh, lectures earlier, you have the major fonticle and the lesser fonticle, and these uh, fonticles, they give also a chance to examine the brain of the, of the newborn baby through the uh, major fonticle. It's very important. A bleedings may be diagnosed with this or major malformations of, in the macroscopy of the brain, like, for example, corpus callosum agenesia. If the anterior neuropore doesn't close, then there is no brain development. And if there is no brain development, there is no skull. Uh, 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 Calvaria development, so the skull, the flat bones of the skull, parietal bone, and the squamous portions of the front, frontal, temporal, and the occipital bone, uh, they will uh, suffer. So what kind of cephalic disorders do we have? First of all, please look around, see your friends, and everybody will have a slightly different shape of the skull, but you've never thought that the, that's kind of like a malformation. So we have a lot of variation in the shape of the skull. But at one point, our eyes already tell us that, OK, that something, something went wrong. And I'm showing now these variations. And these in the background of these variations is mostly that one of the sutures, or more of the sutures, they close earlier and they allow the growth of the skull only in one direction. Uh, you have the scaphocephaly. In this case, the sagittal suture. Uh, is closed earlier, so the, uh, the head may develop only anteriorly and posteriorly, and you get an elongated skull. Or a plagiocephaly, in this case, uh, there is an asymmetrical closure of the, of the sutures uh, between the two sides, you have a discrepancy. Uh, one uh, factor may be also with, uh, with very low birth weight, infants if they are in the incubator for a long time and they are weak to roll their heads here and there. That if they are too much uh, on one side or on the other side, uh, they may have, may have also a similar shape, shape like in the scaphocephaly. This may be corrected with the uh, genetic uh, uh, background later, but sometimes it's also remaining a little bit flatter. And you may have the acrocephaly or turicephaly. Uh, if, if, this, uh, uh, fusion, if this fusion of the sutures uh, interferes with the growth of the brain, so they, they don't allow the growth of the skull, then it has to be operated and, and the pressure has to be freed uh, in the skull uh, in order to allow the brain to grow. Uh, what you see here, this, uh, in this case, this is not a, a first order skull malformation. It is a brain developmental problem, uh, microcephaly. The microcephaly is actually due to the small brain. So the, if the brain doesn't develop, then the, uh, then the size of the skull will follow this small brain. And that's called then microcephaly. This microcephaly nowadays became more important because of the Zika virus in South America These, uh, that causes microcephaly in several cases in pregnant women. About the vertebral column formation, we already told earlier. You have the notochord, neural tube, uh, sclerotomes, uh, cells from the uh, somites. They migrate ventrally. They form this primitive vertebrae. Initially, the nerve was yet in the middle of the primitive vertebrae. But this will be then reorganized. And also, a layer will form here the intervertebral disc. And the uh, notochord will remain as the nucleus pulposus in the intervertebral discs. And the muscles, which were originally in one segment, now they will bridge over to, uh, bridge connect two neighboring vertebrae. You find these small muscles in the deepest layer of the axial musculature. And also, due to this reorganization, the nerves, which were originally in the middle of one original segment, now they will be in between two vertebrae. Uh, this is a vertebra under development, and here you see the notochord. 
and if the arches do not unite of the vertebrae, then you may have the so-called spina bifida. Uh, this uh, spina bifida has several stages. This is the mildest stage when only the bone, bony arch doesn't fuse. About the growth of bones, you heard in the histo lectures, so please go back to those lectures. And remember that the length of the of bones, uh, the growth in length, uh, is provided by the epiphyseal growth plate. And this will allow the growth until the end of the teenage years. And in gro the growth in width, that's subperiosteal bone formation. And that may happen, uh, possible, uh, that may happen theoretically at any time of the life, also in adults. Uh, for pediatricians, sometimes it's important to see the ossification centers in the carpal bones. You don't have to know the sequence. You will learn it if you deal with this problem. You just have to know that the ossification centers appearing in the, in the carpal bones tell the bone age of a child. The bone age may be advanced or delayed versus the real uh, age of the child, and both may show, uh, both, both may be signs uh, of different uh, diseases. Uh, here also you see the growth plate, the growth plate in the uh, radius and growth plate in the ulna. And this is the hand of a teenage person, not yet fully ossified, where the phalanges are yet growing. And if you look at the phalanges, then they always have this epiphyseal growth plate close to the proximal end. And the metacarpal bones, they always have it at the distal end, okay? with all fingers from second to fifth. But if you look at the thumb, then one, two, three. But all of them have the epiphyseal growth plate close to the proximal end of the bone. What does this mean? That Developmentally, this metacarpal bone is truly a phalanx and not a metacarpal bone. That's why we have always the complication with the joints, that we, have always, we always have to speak separately about the joints of the thumb because they are shifted with one uh, level. And thank you for your attention.